The game of baseball in the United States is the oldest major league sport in the country. Major League Baseball traces its roots back to the 1880s, but the game had been enjoyed by Americans for decades before then. The origins of the game are in question. For many years, a 19th century American named Abner Doubleday was credited with creating the game, but this has been proven inaccurate today. One theory is that the game was brought across the Atlantic Ocean during the Great European Migration of the 18th century, and that it is based on the British game of cricket. Cricket is a very popular sport in England, but it is played by mostly the upper-class members of that society, and it is unlikely that the poor immigrants from England played the game very much. However, it more closely resembles the game of rounders, which is another English sport that shares many common features as the American game of baseball. In any event, the game became very popular in the United States. By the 20th century, the American League and the National League were taking the country by storm. The greatest single team in either league's history is the New York Yankees. The Yankees have won more World Series titles than any other team in history. The World Series is a seven-game competition with the two top teams from either league. The first team to win four games is declared the World Series champion. In 1903, the Boston Americans won the first World Series beating the Pittsburgh Pirates. This was the start of an annual series matchup between the two leagues. To date, the Yankees have won 27 championships in 40 appearances, with the team's most recent title coming in 2009. The St. Louis Cardinals lead the National League with 11 titles in 19 appearances, with its last title coming in 2011. The self-portrait is nothing new. Painters and photographers have always used themselves as subjects. Today, however, almost everyone walks around with a camera in his or her pocket. This is because most cell phones have cameras on them. The fact that most people have cell phone cameras with them all the time has led to the rise of the selfie. A selfie is a self-portrait usually taken with a cell phone. Since the pictures are usually taken on a cell phone, many people tend to share these photographs with friends and even strangers on different social networking websites. Some of the popular social networking platforms people use to share selfies include Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook. People usually take selfies when they are engaged in normal day-to-day -day activities. They take selfies of their commutes to work or school. People take selfies of themselves eating. Other people take selfies to show what they are wearing or whom they are hanging out with. The most common way to take a selfie is by holding a cell phone at arm's length. Some people take selfies by taking a picture of their reflection in a mirror. In these pictures, you can usually see the phone the person is taking a picture with. Selfies taken using a mirror often are taken in a bathroom, which some people think is offensive. The bathroom is a very private place, not a place to take pictures. Some people think that selfies are a sign that people are becoming vain or superficial. It is not often that people take pictures of themselves that make them look bad. When people take pictures of themselves, they usually are trying to present themselves in the best light. However, some people use selfies to show what they really look like. Some people are trying to challenge stereotypes of what makes someone attractive. In U.S. cities like New York City and Los Angeles, many people live in small apartments. Despite not having homes with big yards, some apartment dwellers still seek the companionship that domesticated animals like dogs and cats offer. Some people feel that having a pet even in a small space is good for teaching children responsibility. However, many landlords forbid tenants from having pets, specifically cats and dogs, because of the damage the animals can do to carpets. Some landlords even forbid birds because of the noise they make. Many landlords charge an extra fee, known as a pet deposit, to tenants who want to keep pets. This is to pay for repairs or cleaning caused by the pet. Many times, apartment dwellers will choose animals, like fish, hermit crabs, guinea pigs, or hamsters, that make little noise, little mess, and won't chew up the furniture. 
Other people keep lizards as pets, since they don't require much space and can be kept in small cages or tanks. Another benefit of these smaller pets is that they don't need to be walked. However, some people who live in apartments have pets that are not so ordinary. Some of these less-than-ordinary pets include mammals like hedgehogs, amphibians like frogs, and spiders like tarantulas. Not all exotic pets are legal, though. In order to maintain public safety, some cities and states have laws banning specific animals as pets. New York City, for example, bans people from keeping ferrets, snapping turtles, pythons, and scorpions as pets. It seems unlikely that a family would have a polar bear named Fluffy or a whale named Bubbles as a pet. New York City has specific laws banning these wild animals from residences. These laws exist for a good reason. In 2003, a man in a Manhattan apartment was discovered to have a 350-pound Bengal tiger as a pet. One of the darkest days in American history was September 11, 2001. This is a day that will live in infamy for most Americans. It was the most tragic day in the history of the country since December 7, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. September 11th was the day Muslim extremists hijacked four commercial airliners in an attempt to destroy the American spirit by slamming those jets into four buildings. Three of the four jets reached their targets, while one was stopped by a group of everyday heroes who gave their lives for their country. In the early morning hours on September 11, 2001, American Airlines Flight 11 slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. A few minutes later, Flight 175, also an American Airlines flight, struck the South Tower. Both suicide attacks brought the towers down, but not immediately. It took time for the extreme heat from the burning jet fuel to weaken the towers to their eventual collapse. At about the same time, American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon, which is a government building in the country's capital, Washington, D.C. The fourth flight, United Airlines Flight 93, was also headed for the capital city. Most people think its target was either the Capitol building or the White House, the president's home. A group of brave passengers, upon hearing the news of what was happening in the country, decided to take down the giant airplane, even though they knew they would not survive. They stormed the cockpit and took the controls from the hijackers. The plane flew out of control, crashing into a field in the state of Pennsylvania, where all passengers were killed. In all, about 3,000 Americans lost their lives on that day, but the American spirit was not suppressed. Those responsible for the attacks were quickly dealt with, and the country soon began its journey to recovery. September 11th, 2001, a day America will never forget. One of the most beautiful and recognizable California landmarks is the Golden Gate Bridge in the city of San Francisco. The bridge spans the San Francisco Bay and is part of a network of five main bridges that cross the bay in the San Francisco and Oakland area. The region with its bay has one of the most breathtaking views in the world, and part of which is the historic Golden Gate Bridge. It is perhaps the most iconic and recognizable landmark in the entire United States. Construction on the bridge began in 1933, while the country was deeply mired in the Great Depression. Many people think the bridge was, in large part, responsible for the country's economic recovery because of the number of workers employed. The material used to build the bridge also contributed to the manufacturing, distribution, and transportation. The bridge connects San Francisco to the San Francisco Peninsula in Marin County, through both California State Route 1 and U.S. Route 101. Before the bridge was built, the only way to get from one location to the other was to go around the bay or to take a ferry across. Construction of the bridge was controversial at the time. Many thought the project was simply too complex, expensive, and dangerous to build. The construction plan approved concentrated on safety for the workers who would be involved in the construction, and it worked well until February 17, 1937. 
Remarkably, only one worker had died up to that date. But on that date, a scaffolding collapsed, killing 10 men in the tragic accident. The bridge was completed later that year and has been in use ever since. It is one of California's great landmarks with people from all over the world drawn to see it. One of the most historic and significant landmarks in the United States is the San Francisco cable car system. It is the world's only manually operated cable car system. It is run by the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. The system dates back to 1878, when the California Street Line first opened. In all, there are three lines currently operating in the city and boasts a fleet of 12 cable cars. There used to be 23 lines in use throughout the city connecting the diverse communities that make up San Francisco. The open-air cars are a major tourist attraction and are still used by San Francisco commuters on a daily basis. The simple reason cable cars were first used in the city was because of its landscape. San Francisco is very hilly, which makes it impossible for municipal buses to scale. The solution for this problem was the cable car. These cars are literally pulled by cable up and down the steep hills of the city, making it easier for people to get from one end of the city to the other. There are two types of cars in use today, single-ended cars and double-ended cars. The single-ended cars have open-sided sections with seats that face outward to the street. The rear section of these cars is enclosed with seats facing the interior of the car. These cars seat 29 passengers. They travel in both directions by using a swivel-based turntable that turns the car at the end of the line. The double-ended cars are a bit larger and can hold up to 68 passengers. It has 34 seats and grips for an additional 34 standing passengers. The best feature of these cars is the pure fun they are to ride. People who ride the San Francisco cable cars are stepping into part of California's history. Most people don't know that the full name of the Statue of Liberty is the Statue of Liberty Enlightening the World. She is a symbol of freedom, especially for many immigrants. When many immigrants came to the United States in the late 1800s, Lady Liberty in New York Harbor was assigned to tell them that they had made it to America. Inside the base of the statue, there is a plaque with a famous poem written on it. The poem is The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. Many immigrants feel this poem speaks to them the reasons they came to America. One line of the poem is, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Lady Liberty was not always green. She used to be copper-colored, but the years have caused the copper that the statue is made of to change color. The 151-foot tall sculpture was a 100th birthday gift from France to the United States in 1886. It is located on Liberty Island right off the southern tip of Manhattan, New York City. The only way to get there is to take a ferry. Inside the base of the statue is a museum. To get to the crown, people have to climb 377 steps up a double spiral staircase from the feet of the statue. There is no elevator. People need to be in good shape to climb to the top. People used to be able to climb up to the torch of the statue, but it was shut down because it was too easy to fall off. About four million people visit the Statue of Liberty every year. People who can't go to New York can see replicas in Las Vegas and other parts of the world. Rockefeller Center is a complex of 19 buildings. It is named for a famous New York City business magnate, John D. Rockefeller, who built the group of buildings from 1930 to 1939. The most famous building in the complex is the General Electric Building, where NBC television studios are based. It is smack in the middle of Manhattan, New York City, between 5th and 6th Avenues and between 48th and 51st Streets. The address of the GE Building is 30 Rockefeller Plaza. That's how the show 30 Rock got its name. The show was filmed there. Saturday Night Live, a popular American late-night show, is also filmed there. Visitors can get tickets to see a show being taped and can also tour the studios. 
Visitors to Rockefeller Center can visit the plaza, which becomes an ice skating rink in the winter. Every year, a huge Christmas tree is placed there, and thousands of people attend the tree lighting ceremony, which always features famous singers. In the spring, summer, and fall, the plaza becomes a cafe. In the middle of the plaza is a statue of the Greek god Prometheus. His myth states that he brought fire to the world. 200 flags from all countries of the United Nations surround the plaza. Radio City Music Hall is another famous building in Rockefeller Center. Many musicians give concerts here, but it is best known as the home of the Rockettes, a dance company named for Rockefeller Center. They are famous for their kick lines and are best known for performing in the Radio City Christmas Spectacular, an annual musical holiday stage show. Manhattan is a small island that is one part of New York City. New York City, the Big Apple, is actually made up of five sections called boroughs. These boroughs are Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, and the Bronx. Manhattan has the most people of all the boroughs, about 1.5 million, even though it is the smallest borough by size. If you send a letter to someone who lives on Manhattan, don't write Manhattan on the envelope. You should write New York, New York, like the famous Frank Sinatra song. Because the island is so small, most people live and work in tall buildings. Some of these buildings are called skyscrapers because it looks like they are touching the sky. Some famous skyscrapers in Manhattan are Empire State Building, Chrysler Building, 70 Pine Street, Trump Building, GE Building, and Citigroup Center. Manhattan is connected to the other boroughs by a series of bridges and tunnels. The most famous bridge may be the Brooklyn Bridge because of its brick arches. The New York City Subway, a massive mass transit system that mostly runs underground, also connects the island to the rest of the boroughs. Manhattan, like the other boroughs, has many different neighborhoods, many of which are named for the ethnic communities that first lived there. Some of these neighborhoods include Little Italy, Little Germany, Little Brazil, Chinatown, and Koreatown. One of the most famous parts of Manhattan is Times Square. Times Square is called the Crossroads of the World. Every year, millions of people gather there on New Year's Eve to watch an illuminated crystal ball drop. There are many theaters around Times Square. Most of these theaters are on Broadway, a famous street considered the home of the American theater industry. Another famous Manhattan street is Fifth Avenue. A part of the avenue features expensive designer stores like Tiffany's. Fifth Avenue is also famous for its Museum Mile. America is one of the most diversified countries in the world. It is comprised of many different cultures from Latin America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. It is truly a melting pot of diversity. All these cultures have come together to create a new culture, an American culture. Many of the traditions, customs, religions, and celebrations of these cultures have been adopted into American culture, including funeral traditions. Traditional American funerals are basic. They usually include some sort of religious ritual, followed by a procession to the burial grounds and a small ceremony at the gravesite, but these vary depending on the culture. At most American funerals, the deceased person's family sends out a death announcement called an obituary. These obits normally serve to pass information to others about the deceased and the time and day of the funeral event. At the church service, the deceased is usually eulogized by friends and family. This is where a person goes up to the front of the crowd to say a few things about the deceased and how he or she affected their life. The procession usually takes the form of a caravan of private cars and trucks that follow the hearse, which contains the deceased's coffin and remains. At the grave site, another small ritual takes place where the deceased is given a blessing from a member of the clergy. Friends and family are then allowed to say goodbye to the deceased. There is an American tradition of picking up a handful of soil and tossing it on the coffin as a way of saying farewell to the deceased. The family then gathers at a home or restaurant with some of the attendees to have a meal and to exchange stories before going on their way. 
Most cultures in the U.S. have adopted this traditional American funeral ritual, but many include features that are unique to their individual culture. One of the most significant dates in the history of the United States is November 22, 1963. That is the day President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, while riding in an open-air car. The president was visiting Texas for the first time since his inauguration in January 1961. Kennedy was one of the most popular presidents in the history of the United States, and still remains so today. His death shocked the nation for several reasons, but mostly because it was televised on a live broadcast. Kennedy was the first president to appear on television at a time when most Americans owned a TV. He was not the first president to be televised, but previous presidents who appeared on TV did not reach the general public because before 1960, not many Americans owned a set. Kennedy was warned not to ride in an open-air car that day by his bodyguards, but he wanted the public to see him live. He did not want to be hidden behind an armored car, According to the official government commission, Kennedy fell victim to a single assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. But many Americans dispute that finding to this date. Police say Oswald shot the president from a building while Kennedy rode in his car with his wife. The mood was festive at the time as the city of Dallas welcomed the president to Texas. Kennedy was a handsome, young president who was the youngest man ever to reach the presidency. Oswald later killed a Dallas police officer during his escape from the crime scene, but was soon found hiding in a movie theater. He required police protection from an outraged public and was held in protective custody. Oswald, who was a former member of the U.S. military, was unhappy with the president for his policies, but never admitted to being the assassin. Conspiracy theories involving rival political parties, the Cuban government, and organized crime have also been advanced as to who actually killed Kennedy. Generally, people's class is defined by how much money they make. In the U.S., generally, there are three classes, poor, middle class, and rich. Some people also think there is another class in between poor and middle class called working class, United States culture is based on the idea that people can move up the economic ladder and become middle class or even rich if they were born poor. This is the idea of going from rags to riches. Moving up the class ladder is not easy, though. Higher education needed to get a good-paying job is expensive. Class in the United States is more than just how much money a person makes, though. Education, what job a person has, where they live, and the culture— all play a role in what class a person will be classified as. For example, a person with only a high school diploma and a low-paying service job may be considered poor or low class, while a person with a PhD who owns their own company would be considered high class or wealthy. In a way, this makes sense because high-paying jobs usually require a high-level education, but for some people, class is something you are born with. For example, the children of billionaire Donald Trump were born rich and upper class without having done anything to earn that status. Gender plays a role, too, in how someone can move up the economic ladder. Women earn less than men do, so it is harder for them to accumulate wealth. Race also plays a role in how much people earn and their ability to move up the economic ladder. In the United States, most families require both the man and woman to work in order to support the household. The American Civil War happened from 1861 to 1865. The main cause was Southern states feeling that the U.S. federal government in Washington, D.C. should not have the power to tell them what to do. And this was especially true about two issues, taxes and slavery. The southern economy was based on agriculture, while the northern economy was based on manufacturing. Southern crops, like cotton, were sold to factories, and then southerners had to pay taxes on the finished goods sold back to them like clothing. Many southerners felt this was unfair. Additionally, the agricultural economy in the south was reliant on the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants. 
Many people, especially from the North, felt this was wrong and that slavery needed to be abolished. Southerners felt the abolitionists were threatening their way of life. Seven Southern slave states, banded together, declared their secession and formed the Confederate States of America. The government in Washington, D.C. and its army was known as the Union, since they were fighting to keep the country united. Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States during the Civil War. The president of the Confederate States was Jefferson Davis. The first battle was the Battle of Fort Sumter. During the war, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared the freedom of slaves in the Confederate States of America. This action was supposed to show that Lincoln was still in charge of the entire United States. The Civil War was the bloodiest war fought inside the United States. 620,000 were killed and millions more were injured. One of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War was the Battle of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. 51,000 people from both sides died, more than in any other battle. The Civil War ended in 1865 when General Robert E. Lee of the Confederate Army surrendered. The United Nations, an international organization founded in 1945 after the Second World War by 51 countries, has its headquarters along the East River in New York City. Technically, anyone who visits UN headquarters is not in New York anymore. They are not even in the United States. That is because the land and buildings are considered international territory. The United Nations has its own flag, its own post office, and its own postage stamps. There is no need to change currency, however. The UN uses the US dollar. Six official languages are used at the United Nations. They are Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. UN rules override the laws of New York City. This does not mean that people can commit crimes there and get away with it. There is no immunity to those who commit crimes there. The property where the United Nations now stands used to belong to a slaughterhouse. The current buildings were completed in 1952. The perimeter of the UN is lined with flagpoles with the flags of all 193 UN member states and the UN flag. They are arranged in alphabetical order in English. Some may think it's great to be a neighbor to a peacekeeping agency like the UN. Many New Yorkers don't always think so, though. Every time a dignitary like a president or prime minister visits, streets are closed, making it hard to get around and to find parking. You don't need to be a diplomat to visit the UN, though. There are tours Monday through Friday, and not just in English. Guided tours are available in English, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Mandarin, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Swedish. Visitors can have a meal at the delegates' dining room, featuring a buffet of food from all over the world. The Beatles are an English group of musicians from Liverpool, England. It took America by storm with their appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show on primetime television. The group's first appearance was seen by more than 73 million viewers in February 1964, introducing the band to the American people. In the months to follow, the group became the biggest rock and roll band ever to hit the United States. The group's success opened the door for other British bands to make their way to America. Bands such as the Rolling Stones, the Who the Kinks, and the Dave Clark Five were soon playing their music to American audiences. The Beatles were made up by four of the finest musicians to ever play rock music. Their lead singer was Paul McCartney and drummer Ringo Starr. Both still play to this day. Two of the original members, singers and songwriters John Lennon and George Harrison, have tragically passed away, but their music lives in American culture to this day. The Beatles have sold more records in the United States than any other country in the world. There was controversy in the U.S. prior to the group's first appearance. Conservative Americans viewed the Beatles as upstarts with brash, new ideas, lyrics, and sound. The young generation of the time was ready for a change, and the Beatles gave them what they wanted. They were nicknamed the Mop Tops because of their long, bowl-like haircuts that flew in the face of convention in the 60s. 
Nothing was going to stop the Beatles, though. Their music is as popular today as it was 50-plus years ago. In the United States, people love to throw parties for many reasons. Of course, there are the usual birthday parties, but some people even have parties to celebrate divorces. No matter what kind of party you are going to, it's a good idea to make sure you are actually invited. It's considered rude to just show up unless the host, the person giving the party, invited you. You will either get a paper, email, or verbal invitation to a party. Alternately, you can also go as a guest of someone else invited, like as his or her date. Once invited, it is very important to let the host know if you are actually going to show up. Many times, hosts have a party catered, which means other people prepare the food. They need to know how much food to have. Letting them know if you are showing up or not helps the host and is considered polite. It's also important to be relatively punctual for a party. Most parties in the U.S. never start exactly when they say they will. Many people like to be fashionably late, that is, showing up about 30 minutes after the party is supposed to start. People like to do this to make a big entrance. Showing up more than 30 minutes before or after is considered rude, though. If you show up too early, you are likely to interrupt valuable preparation time of the host. If you show up too late, you are just being rude. Even if it is not a birthday party, it is polite to bring a gift for the host. It doesn't need to be a fancy gift. A bottle of wine or even flowers is polite and will be appreciated. A housewarming party is a special party to be held when someone buys or moves into a new apartment or house. The person or people who bought the property or moved are the ones who throw the party. The party is an opportunity for friends and family to congratulate the person on the new home. It also gives people a chance to see what the new home looks like. It's an opportunity to fill the new space with love and hopefully presents. It is traditional to bring a gift to a housewarming party. Some people register a list of items they want or need for their new home at a local store or stores. Some common items people will put on a gift registry include kitchen tools like knives and items like curtains. Even if there isn't a registry, a good housewarming gift is something to decorate the new house with like a piece of art or a plant. You can also bring food or drinks to share with the other guests. This is often appreciated since at a housewarming there isn't a lot of food served, usually just appetizers or sandwiches. There are usually no planned activities like games at a housewarming party. The host or hostess of the party will, however, probably give all the guests a tour of their new home. Sometimes, because a housewarming party happens shortly after a person moves into their new home, people may be asked to help unpack boxes. This isn't usual, though. Housewarming parties get their name from the fact that a long time ago, people would actually bring firewood to a new home as a gift. This was so that the person could keep their home warm for the winter. Now, most homes have central heating and don't use fires to keep warm. The religious or civil ceremony that makes people legally a married couple is just one part of the actual wedding. After the wedding comes the reception. A wedding reception is a party held immediately after the marriage ceremony. Usually there is a little bit of time, about an hour between the ceremony and the reception, to give people enough time to travel from the ceremony location to the reception location. Most wedding receptions are held at a catering hall, which is a place that specializes in hosting big parties. However, wedding receptions can be held in restaurants, parks, and even in museums or zoos. A wedding reception is usually not held at the same place as the ceremony, but sometimes they do. When guests arrive at the reception, the bride and groom are usually not there to meet them. Right after the ceremony, the newly married couple, the bridesmaids, and the groomsmen will go somewhere to have photographs taken. While this is happening, guests are usually treated to a cocktail hour at the reception site. During this time, appetizers and drinks are served. This also gives guests a chance to socialize. After the cocktail hour, the main dining hall is opened. At a wedding reception, the seating is usually prearranged. 
Each guest will receive a card telling him or her where they are expected to sit. Tables are arranged by numbers. In front of the reception hall, there's a special table for the bride and groom. Once everyone is seated, waiters begin to serve salad or bread and drinks. Some receptions have an open bar, meaning the alcohol is free. Other receptions have a case bar, meaning non-alcoholic beverages are free. Guests are expected to pay for their own alcoholic drinks. Who says adult parties have to be boring? More and more adults are reliving their childhoods or creating memories they didn't have as children by having theme parties for their birthday or other occasions. Theme parties are based on an idea, a television show, a fictional character, or really anything. Sometimes guests are expected to dress according to the theme as well. For example, the toga party is a type of theme party where guests are expected to dress in togas, really just white sheets. Toga parties used to be especially popular among college students. In a masquerade party, everyone wears a mask and has to guess who is behind it. The mystery is part of the fun. Speaking of mystery, there are murder mystery parties where the guests have to solve a fake murder. Some adults throw parties based on seasons. A summer beach party, for example, might feature guests wearing their swimsuits. Another popular type of theme party is the game night party. In this type of party, people get together to play various board games. A variation of the game night party is the casino party, where adults play games typically found in a casino-like blackjack or poker. Another theme party could focus on a specific region or country. For example, a Mexican theme party might feature tacos, the colors of the Mexican flag, and Mexican music. Guests should be careful when dressing up for these types of theme parties, though. Dressing up like a certain ethnic or racial group is usually considered offensive. It's better to just enjoy the food and not portray a stereotype. In the United States, someone legally becomes an adult when they turn 18 years old. At 18, U.S. citizens can vote. They can also serve in the military and go fight in wars for the country. An 18-year-old can also buy cigarettes and other tobacco products, but 18-year-olds cannot buy alcoholic beverages. People in the U.S. need to wait until they are 21 to be able to do that. At the age of 18, people can legally live on their own, work, and get married. However, turning 18 doesn't mean everyone is ready to take on adult responsibilities. At the age of 18, most people are just graduating from high school. Many will go to college. Some young people choose to go to college far from their homes and live in dormitories. Others pick a college close to home and stay with their parents to save money. Yet others will choose to live on their own. Legally, a parent does not have to provide for their child when the child turns 18. Some parents in the U.S. take this very seriously and expect their children to move out as soon as they turn 18. Some parents will even forcibly kick their kids out when the kids turn 18. There tends to be some difference about this depending on if the kid is female or male. It is considered more acceptable for a female to stay living with her parents after her 18th birthday. Many females aren't expected to leave their parents' house until they get married. There is still an expectation for young men, however, to go out and live independent lives as soon as they can. With the economy of the U.S. struggling, some adult children are returning to their parents' home in their 20s and 30s. These are called boomerang kids, since, like a boomerang, they return where they came from. In the United States, the baby boomer generation includes those that were born in the time after World War II. Those babies are now reaching the retirement age. As these adults age, many of their adult children worry about how they will take care of their aging parents. In the United States, it is not common for multiple generations to live under one roof. Once children grow up and get married, they move out, leaving their aging parents to fend for themselves. When these aging parents can no longer take care of themselves because of age or illness, it is not uncommon for adult children in the U.S. to place their elderly parents in a nursing home. A nursing home is a facility that offers care for the elderly and ill 24 hours a day. As the name suggests, 
Nursing Homes has medical nurses, doctors, social workers, and therapists to help aging adults deal with the challenges of daily life. Most nursing homes also have social activities for the elderly to engage in and keep active. These activities range from games to dance classes and movie nights. Nursing homes are supposed to provide three nutritious meals for their residents. Nursing homes are controversial, however. There have been cases across the country of staff in nursing homes abusing and even robbing the elderly residents. There are different states and federal agencies that are supposed to oversee nursing home facilities. Some people feel that it should be the responsibility of family members, especially adult children, to care for their aging or ill parents. However, Many adult children have their own children and families to take care of and do not have the means to care for their elderly parents. Others worry about medical skills needed if their elderly parents are seriously ill. Having your own space is a sign of success in the United States. However, renting an apartment is not easy. There are a number of steps you need to take. First, you need to figure out how much you can pay per month. When you first move into a new place, most landlords or property owners expect you, the tenant, to pay a security deposit. A security deposit is an amount of money you pay a landlord, sort of as insurance that you won't destroy their property while you are living there. Usually, the security deposit is equal to the amount of one month rent. If when you move out, the apartment is in the same condition as when you moved in, the landlord will return your security deposit. If the apartment has any damage whatsoever, including holes in the walls because you hung up posters, the landlord can legally use that money to fix the apartment. Once you know how much you can afford, you can begin looking for apartments for rent. You can look in the newspaper or online. Also, walk around a neighborhood you want to live in and be on the lookout for for rent signs. There are two ways to rent an apartment. Most landlords rent out apartments on an annual basis. This means you will sign a document called a lease, which says you will stay in the property for one year and pay rent on a monthly basis. If you decide that you want to break the lease or leave before your year is up, there are usually fines you will have to pay. Another way to rent an apartment is on a month-to-month -month basis. This means that you pay by month and are not obligated to stay for more than a month at a time. Once you find an apartment you want to rent, you need to contact the landlord, the person who owns the property. Most landlords are not individuals anymore, but rather are companies that own a number of properties. You and the landlord will set a date to view the place you are interested in renting. On that date, you can see the apartment and ask questions. Some landlords will require you to fill out an application. The application will ask questions about your job, salary, and how many people are going to live with you in the apartment. The landlord wants to make sure they have responsible tenants who will pay rent on time. Some landlords will even ask for references, the names and telephone numbers of people who can verify that you have a job and are a responsible person. Most landlords will also run a credit check. A credit check is your history of paying bills on time. If your potential landlord sees that you owe a lot of money to different companies and don't pay your bills on time, they may not want you as a tenant. If you have bad credit or an unstable work history, you may be required to get a co-signer. That is another financially responsible adult to sign the lease, a rental contract, with you. This co-signer is legally responsible for paying the rent if you stop paying. If you cannot afford a full apartment, another option is to rent a room in someone's home. The process to rent a room is like renting an apartment, except you only have a room and usually have to share the bathroom and the kitchen. Most apartments and rooms in the U.S. are unfurnished. You are expected to bring your own furniture, including a bed, a dresser, a sofa, and anything else you need. If you want to rent an apartment, you need to sign a lease, which is a legally binding contract between you and the landlord, the person who owns the property. A lease is usually good for a set time. Some leases are on a month-to-month -month basis, but most are for a period of one year or two years. The lease or rental agreement lists out your responsibilities as a tenant, 
and the landlord's responsibilities. The lease will tell you how much the monthly rent is, when it is due, and how you can pay it. Some landlords will only take a certified check or money order, and others will accept a personal check or cash. If you pay your rent late, there is usually a late fee. The amount of the late fee is also usually in the lease. The lease will also tell you how much the security deposit is. Usually, it is the amount of one month's rent. The lease will tell you if you can have pets or not. Many places do not allow pets. If you bring one in anyway, they can fine you or kick you out. If your apartment does allow pets, most likely you will have to pay an extra amount of money, called a pet deposit, to cover any damages caused by the animal. Other rules that may be included in a lease include whether you are allowed to smoke inside the property and whether you are allowed to make any changes like paint. Many landlords do not allow you to paint or even make holes in the wall to hang up pictures. A lease is proof that you legally live somewhere. Sometimes you need a lease to show a school that you live within a certain area. Make sure you get a copy of the signed lease from your landlord. Veterans Day is an official United States holiday observed on November 11th every year. While Memorial Day remembers those who have died while serving in any of the branches of the U.S. Armed Forces, Army, Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard, Veterans Day honors all members of the armed forces, especially the living. As a U.S. federal holiday, government offices and schools are closed, and most people have the day off from work. Banks are also closed. If November 11th falls on a Sunday, then the holiday is observed on the following Monday. The holiday was first observed after World War I, which ended on November 11th, 1918. It was called Armistice Day then, and was more about celebrating the absence of war and honoring those that served in that one war. It didn't become known as Veterans Day until 1954, after World War II and the Korean War, when there were many more members of the armed forces. Many restaurants offer free meals to veterans on the date. There is always a special ceremony at Arlington National Military Cemetery in Washington, D.C. This ceremony involves a wreath being placed over the grave of the unknown soldier. Many major cities also hold parades on this date. The U.S. flag is usually flown at half-mast as a remembrance to those soldiers who have died, and many ceremonies observe a moment of silence for the same reason. In Canada, the holiday is called Remembrance Day. One symbol of the day is the poppy flower. The red poppy flower is said to represent or be a symbol of the blood of soldiers. Many people wear or give out poppy flowers on the day. Thanksgiving is a holiday celebrated by many people in the United States and Canada. In the United States, it is celebrated on the fourth Thursday in November and marks the start of the Christmas season. Some people celebrate Thanksgiving to remember the first harvest of the pilgrims and Puritans, groups of people from England who immigrated to North America in the 1600s. Some people recreate the first Thanksgiving and dress up as pilgrims, Puritans, and the Native Americans who are said to have helped the new arrivals find food to survive their first winter. Most people, however, see Thanksgiving as one day a year to reflect upon what they are thankful for. Some families will sit together and take turns saying aloud what they are thankful for. An important part of Thanksgiving is families coming together. Extended family members often travel long distances to share the day with their loved ones. In the United States, Thanksgiving is the busiest travel day of the year. People travel in planes, trains, buses, and cars to share a very special meal, Thanksgiving dinner. What most Thanksgiving celebrations have in common is the food. On Thanksgiving, many families prepare large, elaborate dinners to share with friends and loved ones. Many of these dinners use ingredients associated with the fall harvest, like cranberries, potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn, and blueberries. Roast turkey is the traditional meat served. It is so common that some people call Thanksgiving Day Turkey Day. The turkey is usually served with gravy and stuffing. 
Pies are usually served for dessert. The most common pies served are sweet potato, apple, pecan, and pumpkin. Thanksgiving is not just celebrated in the privacy of people's homes. Every year, the President of the United States pardons a turkey, saving it from becoming someone's meal. In New York City, Macy's, a department store, holds a large parade with huge balloons of various cartoon characters floating down the street. In the United States, 43 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands all have their own lottery. A lottery is used for states to raise money. Licensed stores sell numbered tickets, or people can pay to choose their own numbers. When you let a machine pick your numbers, it is usually called a quick pick. Many people play lucky numbers, numbers associated with birth dates or other important numbers to them. The money earned from selling lottery tickets goes to pay for schools, roads, bridges, and other public services. Once a week or more, a drawing is held where the numbers are randomly picked. If your ticket has those numbers, you could win a cash prize. There are different types of lotteries, such as Powerball, Mega Millions, and Lotto. Powerball and Mega Millions are known for their large payouts. There are also instant lottery tickets that are scratch-off cards. The winnings tend to be less money, but they are extremely popular. In the United States, you can play the lottery or buy a ticket if you are 18 years or older. If you win, usually you have the option of being paid the entire amount in one lump sum or of being paid smaller amounts over a number of years. Lottery winnings are taxable, meaning the amount you actually get is smaller than the jackpot number. People can buy lottery tickets or play the lottery at many convenience stores. Lotteries are also very popular since they advertise. There are many television commercials, radio commercials, and billboards urging people to play. Lotteries have been controversial since they are essentially a form of legalized gambling. There is concern that it can lead to people becoming addicted to gambling. There are also illegal lottery games, usually run by some forms of organized crime. Immigration in the United States is a complicated and controversial issue. Since the founding of the country, people have come from different countries in search of a better life and opportunities. Immigration laws, however, are always changing and are complicated. This leads to many people coming into the U.S. without proper legal status. While some people call immigrants who come and stay in the U.S. without the proper papers illegals, many consider this term offensive. The more acceptable term is undocumented, since they do not have the correct legal documents. It is estimated that there are more than 11 million undocumented people in the United States. While some people will say there is no reason for immigrants to be undocumented in the U.S., there are limits on the number of green cards or legal permanent resident cards people from certain countries can get. There are also long waiting lists, up to 14 years in some cases, for people coming from certain countries to apply for legal status in the U.S. Additionally, there are a limited amount of visas or permits for people coming into the U.S. with manual labor skills. Millions of undocumented people have been deported or sent back to their country of origin under President Obama. In 2013, the U.S. Senate passed an immigration reform bill. The law adds extra border security along the U.S.-Mexico border and also makes it easier for immigrants to become citizens. The bill, which also has to be approved by the House of Representatives, has not yet been presented or voted on by Congress. Because of this, many are asking President Obama to take action to protect some of the undocumented, many of whom have been in the U.S. for many years, and have children that are U.S. citizens. The American Community College System is a place for second chances. Community colleges are two-year schools that thrived in California after the end of World War II. Many American military personnel were returning to civilian life after their service to the country. Some of these young people decided not to go to college after high school so that they could serve their country during that time of need. When they returned, many of them turned to the community college system in California to continue their education. The United States government introduced the GI Bill at that time 
giving returning servicemen and women educational benefits to help them get back to school. Soon, community colleges and new school districts began appearing throughout the country. Community colleges helped ease returning military personnel back into college life. It was a low-cost, less stressful alternative to going back to a four-year university. Today, community colleges attract students from all parts of the world. In California, a large population of students comes from Asia and Latin America. These schools provide a second chance to international students who may have experienced difficulties attending college in their native countries. American students who may have not done well academically in high school and did not enter a university can turn to community college for a second chance, too. Community colleges provide a much-needed resource for all these students. Former military personnel, international students, and high school students alike are all welcome. One of the best things about community colleges is that they accept anyone at any time. This means people who have not found what they want to do in life can try more than one area of study. If they don't like one course of study, they can always try something else. That is the beauty of community colleges. These days, many people attend community colleges with plans to transfer to a four-year college or university to get a bachelor's degree. It's kind of like a stepping stone. There are many reasons why people do this. One reason is that some community colleges have transfer agreements with private and state colleges and universities that guarantee admission. Even if a community college doesn't have that agreement of a guaranteed spot in a four-year college, it has articulation agreements with four-year schools. These agreements tell you exactly what classes a student in a community college needs to take in order to be able to transfer. These agreements make sure that students don't waste time taking classes that won't transfer. Most of these classes one needs to take before transferring are general education classes, like math and English. Another reason why many students start their undergraduate degree at a community college is a financial one. A four-year college or university is much more expensive than a two-year college. This is especially true for immigrant students who don't qualify for financial aid, loans, or scholarships. Also, community colleges tend to offer more evening classes so they can accommodate people who have to work while attending school. They are also a good option for older students with families who need a more flexible schedule while taking care of children. Community colleges also tend to be commuter schools, meaning people don't have to live on campus in dorms. Attending a community college means you can still live at home with your parents, which can save the family a huge amount of money. If a student didn't do well in high school, a community college would provide him or her with another opportunity to enter a four-year university. Community colleges offer many classes to help students develop their math and writing skills. When you attend a four-year college, you are expected to have those skills already. Community college will prepare students to successfully graduate from a four-year school. After middle or junior high school, U.S. students go to high school. Going to school is free in the United States, including high schools. Students do not need to pay tuitions, and even textbooks and lunches are free. Of course, we are talking about public schools. If parents choose to send their kids to private schools, they need to pay very expensive tuitions. High school is the last four years of school that students in the U.S. are required to attend by law. High school students are divided by grades. It begins at ninth grade and finishes with 12th grade. Some high schools, even public high schools, have admission exams or an application process. Public schools admit students based on where they live. In order to successfully complete high school, students have to complete a series of core classes, including math, English, science, history, a foreign language, and gym or physical education. Students usually can also choose to take electives or specialized courses in a subject that interests them. Some high schools in the U.S. have exit exams that students are required to pass, in addition to completing their courses in order to graduate and earn a high school diploma. A law called the No Child Left Behind Act requires high schools that get federal money to make students take a standardized exam every year. 
A high school diploma is required for students who want to continue on to college and is considered a minimum requirement for any jobs. A high school's classes are designed to prepare students for college. Some high schools offer specialized skills so that students can find work after graduation without going to college. Those are called vocational high schools. In high school, some students have the opportunity to take advanced placement, AP, classes. These are college-level classes. If the students pass an exam after taking AP classes, they can get college credit. In high school, students move from class to class throughout the school day. Not every parent looks forward to the day when their child goes off to school. In fact, some parents are not sending their students to school at all. Instead, they are choosing to teach their children at home. This is called a homeschooling. Parents, caregivers, or private tutors educate children individually at home instead of sending them off to be formally educated in public or private schools. In the U.S., only about 3% of children are homeschooled. There are many reasons why some parents choose to homeschool. One reason is that some parents do not feel their children are safe in school because of bullying and a growing trend of police in school. Other parents want their child's education to be based on their religion or moral beliefs. Yet other parents feel like the education in school is not good enough. Homeschooling is also seen as a choice for families that live in rural areas and families that travel, like actors. There are many different ways to homeschool, and homeschooling allows parents to customize lessons based on their children's needs. Families can purchase textbooks to use or create their own materials. Some parents follow a philosophy called unschooling, which allows a child to determine when and how they want to learn based on their natural curiosity. Some worry that homeschooling means students won't have opportunities to socialize. To answer this concern, some families have created cooperatives, where a group of homeschooled students will learn and play together and participate in activities that would normally happen in school, like field trips and prom. Being homeschooled doesn't mean a student cannot go to college. Most colleges accept homeschooled students. It is important, however, for parents and students to create a portfolio or proof of what has been learned. When parents send their children to school, often they don't know what happens day to day. Parents rely on what their children tell them about how they are doing and what they are learning. Generally, schools will host parent-teacher conferences at least twice a year. Parent-teacher conferences are short meetings between parents and their children's teachers. Usually, parent-teacher conferences are held when teachers give out a student's grades for the term. The parent-teacher conferences give teachers an opportunity to let parents know how their child is doing. A teacher will let a parent know the student's strengths and bring to the parent's attention any problems with grades or behavior. The meetings also offer parents the opportunity to ask questions and see what their child is learning. When it is almost time for parent-teacher conferences, the school will send parents a note and usually give them an appointment time. There are appointments during the day and in the evening. Evening appointments are used for parents who work during the day. Parent-teacher conferences do not last very long. Normally, they do not last longer than 10 minutes. This is why it is important for parents to make sure they arrive at their appointments on time and come prepared with questions. If a parent needs more than 10 minutes, he or she should try to schedule another meeting with the teacher. Keeping a teacher for more than 10 minutes when there are parents waiting is disrespectful. Most children do not go along with their parents to the meetings. This allows both the parent and teacher to talk honestly about the child's progress without making the child feel bad. Usually a teacher will offer advice to the parent on how to support their child's education. Driving in the U.S. can be confusing, not just because of all the rules and laws that drivers must follow, but also because of driving customs. Many people in the U.S. are really dependent on their cars to get to work and school. In fact, most American workers spend an hour driving to work each day. In order to drive in the U.S., you have to go to your local Department of Motor Vehicles first and take a written test to get your learner's permit. 
If you pass this test, you can practice driving so you can pass a road test and get your license. The Department of Motor Vehicles, or DMV, has free booklets you can go and get to study for your learner's permit. You can also access the information online and even take a practice written exam. To prepare for the road test, you can have a friend teach you to drive or pay to take classes at a driving school. You cannot, however, practice driving by yourself. If you're caught driving with only a learner's permit, you can get into trouble with the law. Once you get your driver's license in one state, you can use it to drive in all of the United States. Wherever you drive, you will see signs posted along the road indicating the speed limit. These numbers are not a suggestion. Generally, you can drive faster on a highway than on local streets. Local police use special equipment to detect your speed. If they detect you are speeding or driving over the speed limit, police can stop you and give you a ticket. You will have to pay a fine, and some of the fines are more than $100. The lines painted on the road are not just to keep cars in their lanes. They send a message. For example, a double solid yellow line means that it is against the law to pass another car here.